Well, good morning. It, uh, it's good to be here. It's hard to believe it's still winter. The last couple of days, the weather's kind of felt more like spring, but wait, I don't think winter's going to be completely over. Um, today, I wanted to ask ourselves, including myself, two questions. And one of those questions is, what has God been teaching you lately? Okay. Maybe in the last couple of months, the last year, what are the things that God has been teaching you? I think that's an important question as believers for us to ask ourselves. But an equally important question is, are you learning the lessons? Because you can go to school and not learn anything. And I think sometimes that can happen in the Christian life. How open are you to the things that God wants to teach you? Now, we read that verse, Kent read that verse, um, it is Romans 8, 28. It is often used wrongly, taken out of context. Remember, part of the context of that was groaning and suffering and all those kinds of things. But I want to reread that for you. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Notice what it says there. We know. We don't assume. We don't wonder. We know this. It is a fact. And then it says he causes everything, not some things, but everything. So the good things, the bad things, he can take any situation and work it for good. Notice it also says there to work and to work takes time. We have to be patient with this process. It says together for the good, for the benefit of those that love God, according to his purpose for them. Was that true of Joseph in Egypt? It was, wasn't it? How long did that take? 18 years? We have a God that can take the pits of life that our family throw us in, other people, and he can turn that around. We have a God that can take the part of his houses of life where we're falsely accused, our reputations are trashed, and we're falsely imprisoned. And he can take the prisons of life where people ignore us and we're helping other people, but it doesn't seem to be coming back to us. You see, eventually he ended up in the palace. But that was a journey through the pit, part of his house, and prison. Do you trust God enough with his timing? I mean, it says at the right time Christ came. I'm sure if they were suffering back in Egypt, that wasn't the right time for them, right? We, we want God to fit into our calendar. And one of the questions I have to ask myself regularly is, am I on Christ's calendar or am I trying to get Christ on my calendar? So what do you do with the disappointments of life? What do you do with the heartache and the hurts and when things aren't going maybe the way that you would like them to go and maybe even the trauma of life? Well, God's been teaching me some lessons through an unusual way. He often does that. He's been teaching me lessons through a little finger. Lessons through a little finger from a loving God. You see, um, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you knew this, but log splitters can split more than wood. They can, they can do fingers too. And uh, I had a, a big round of wood in and I was running the splitter and it, when it finally broke free, it flew that chunk out and directly blunt form a tross, uh, force into the end of my pinky and shattered it. Now fortunately, I only hit the one finger, could have hit all of them. Why today? Can I ask this question? Is there ever a good day to get your pinky busted? No. We often say that. Why today? I, I, like tomorrow would have been way better, right? I, I could have scheduled that and been ready for it. But we say that, don't we? Um, here's a couple of lessons God's been teaching me through this process. First, face the facts. Not just your feelings. Now, we're going to talk about feelings in a little bit. Feelings are good, but you have to face the facts. 
Here's a fact. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus told us that. And sometimes that's because there are accidents. No one's fault. It's just the way it was. Sometimes it's because stupidity, you know? Now, had I had my hand in it and done that, that would have just been stupid. This was an accident. But sometimes it's because of sin, the sin that we commit or the sin that's done to us or just living in a sinful world. But in this world, you have trouble. But you see, when that first happened, you would have thought I would have had just sheer shooting pain. But it wasn't actually that bad. And I think it's because of that marvelous miracle called adrenaline. But I thought I had just nicked my finger. And so I took the glove off and it revealed the truth that my finger was snapped and hanging and I thought I'd lose it. Now, I had two choices at that point. I could face the facts and go do something about it. Or I could just put my glove on and say, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, here's a free one, by the way. If you're married and your spouse, you say to them, is everything okay? And they say, I'm fine. <laughs> That's not true. But you see, I had to make a choice. What am I going to do with the facts? I didn't like the facts. I was hoping it was nicked. I could handle that. I, that, that would have been great. When I looked at it, I thought, man, I'm going to lose my finger here. I can't just put my glove back on and pretend. And some of us, we've been hurt and we, we've not been willing to face the facts of what was done to us or what we've done to ourselves. And we're just putting the glove on and pretending, hey, everything's fine when it's not fine. Second thing is, sometimes you don't think things are worth saving based on how they look. We do this all the time. We look at the circumstances and then we decide, am I going to be obedient to what God wants me to do? I didn't think the finger could be saved. Um, in fact, on the way to the emergency room, I said, Angel, yeah, I'm going to lose the finger. I mean, it's that bad. Um, but we do this with a lot of things in life. And one of them is people. We look at people. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that live around this church. And some of us look at their situation. We say, oh, they'll never get saved. We write them off. Well, I, I could have just cut my finger off. Oh, it's not going to work. Just cut it off. Sear it. Don't need to go to the doctor right? Well, I'm glad I didn't do that because it was worth saving. They didn't think it was for a while, but it was. Sometimes we do that in relationships like marriage. Pull the glove of marriage off and we go, man, my marriage is a mess. It's not worth saving. So what do we do? We take the butcher knife of divorce and we just cut it off. Guess what? We have to deal with the consequences of that the rest of our lives along with our kids. Sometimes we do that with, with children, prodigal children. We write them off. They'll never come back to Jesus. I am a prodigal son. Fortunately, I'm no longer a prodigal son. I'm a preacher. What made the difference? Came back to Jesus because my mom kept praying. She didn't give up. And we do this a lot, sometimes in our own lives, with depression. And sometimes we think, well, suicide is the answer. I'm just going to write it off. It's not worth saving. You are worth saving. And if you want any evidence of that, Jesus Christ died for all. You're so worth saving that Jesus died for you, not just spiritually, but physically. Another thing I've learned is you need people. And you can't wait until you go through the hard things of life to cultivate those relationships. I knew exactly who I was going to go to to ask for help. And I already had that relationship built in. Another thing I've learned is this thing that we all go through called miscommunication. Miscommunication doesn't have to lead to frustration and it doesn't have to lead to devastation. Now, when I went in, uh, I kept the glove on because I didn't want everybody to have to be traumatized by what I'd seen. It was really ugly. And there was a bunch of people in that house. One of them was my wife. That's who I was looking for because I needed her 
to take me to the emergency room. And so I communicated, I don't want to say, hey, I busted my finger and freak everybody out. So I did it silently and I did this. I pointed to myself and then I pointed to Angel. And this is what I was meaning. I need you. Okay. Here's the problem. When our kids were little, really little, I taught them this. When I point to myself and I point to you, that means I love you. So that when they're in high school and they're on the basketball court and they miss a shot, and they look up in the bleachers, they don't need me yelling out, I love you, but I can do this. And so when I did that, angel mouth back, I love you too. <laughs> That's wonderful, honey, but right now I need you. Now I need you and I love you are very close together, right? But there's some differences. And I'm going to tell you in the very stressful moments of life is when we often miscommunicate. And there are many, many marriages today that are a mess because I'm, I'm saying I need you and she's saying I love you and we're just not, we're close, but we're not really on the same page. I could have gotten really upset. My finger was really starting to hurt. But I just backed up and I said, no, I need you. I didn't get upset because she didn't understand. I miscommunicated, and regardless of whether it was her or me, Miscommunication doesn't have to lead to frustration or devastation. Another thing is you need, to, uh, you need to know where to go when you're hurt and with your hurts. Um, I needed more than just Angel. I needed an emergency room. I needed her to take me there, but she wasn't going to actually do the x-rays and the stitching and all the other stuff. She was just getting me there. We need multiple people in our lives when we go through tough things. And here's what most of us do, especially when we're hurt in the church. We want the emergency room to come to us. And when it doesn't, we get mad. Hey, here's the facts. The emergency room was never going to come to my house. They weren't going to send a crew out to come take care of me in my backyard. The reality is I had to go to them. And, and maybe there's some places in your life where you've gotten upset with a church or upset with whatever because you you wanted them to come to you where maybe you needed to go to them a sixth thing i've learned is you need to know what's going on on the inside one of the things first things that they did um after they asked me how i did it um is they said okay we need to get x-rays i mean you can't just look and tell no we, we want to do that all the time in our marriages, right? Like this Disney, you're just going to magically know what's going on in my mind. We need to know what's going on in the inside of our lives. And the Word of God is like an x-ray. It will reveal what's really going on. And what it revealed was all the bone in the end of my finger was smashed to dust. It wasn't a great thing. But again, do you want to live in ignorance? Do you want to really know what's going on? And some of us avoid getting into the Word of God because we're not willing to pray the prayer that David prayed, Lord, search me and show me my heart. Show me if there's anything in me that offends you. What, what's broken that needs to be fixed? Um, we like behavioral modification, but the truth is we need heart correction. If our kids just do the right thing, but their hearts are not in the right place, it's just an outward show. What's really going on in my heart, Lord? Because the Bible says what? The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And sometimes we say these things and we're like, where'd that come from? Something's going on, on the inside and we need to take a look at that. And this, this seventh one is kind of tied to that. And it's, a sin is not a surface thing. It wants to infect to the core. It's, it's getting under the surface, kind of like an x-ray. But once they realize, here's what's broken, now we need to start to fix that. And what they did is they gave me antibiotics. And they said, you know, the worst case scenario is if an, an infection gets into the bone and what's left there, you will lose that finger and possibly a hand. It's that serious. Sin wants to rot you from the inside out. The Word of God is the antibiotic. What I love about the Word of God, it doesn't just x-ray and say, hey, here's what's broken. Now you go figure it out. It also is the medicine that we need. 
Another thing is, sometimes you need to be numb, or you need to numb the hurt, but not forever, and you need to numb it in an appropriate way. Um, I'm thankful that they numbed my finger before they stitched it. Um, that was really nice, actually, to not be able to feel it. There were days when it really hurt that I was like, could you just numb it again? Sometimes I just like to be perpetually numb, but here's the problem with that. I'm going to bump it into things and hurt it more because I, I won't be able to feel anything, right? And so there are times in our lives that, that we do need to be numb, but it's, it's for healing. And one of the things that we have to ask is, what are we using to numb ourselves? Because some of us are not living lives of feeling. Um, some of us are using food. We don't like certain things. It doesn't make us feel good. So we're going for a feel good, a numbing agent. We all know alcohol and drugs. You know, that's, that's a way to numb. Uh, Netflix, just binge watch. I don't want to face my spouse, my kids, life. Th there's a million different ways to numb us, but you know what all of those do long term is hurt us. The ninth thing I learned is you sometimes need to immobilize it, but not forever. They put a splint on there, and um, they said, we don't want it moving for a little while, okay? But they just said for a little while. Sometimes what we do is we isolate, and there are times we need to disconnect, but not from relationships. Okay, that's, that's not a splint. That's going to be a splinter. That's going to hurt you. Do you know what the Bible talks about the devil going around like a roaring lion looking for those he can devour, right? How do lions hunt? They separate off of the herd. As long as they stay with the herd, and sometimes the herd will come back, and then the lions have to run away. They're not as powerful as you think unless you give them that power by isolating yourself. Tenth thing, this is kind of no-brainer, but you can't stay in the emergency room forever. There are different stages to healing what's broken. I needed the emergency room, but there came a point where they said, okay, it's time to leave. Um, and they said, you need to go in three days. You need to see a hand specialist, a hand surgeon. It's that serious. And I was like, well, I kind of like you. You're a good doctor. You, you, can I just stay with you? I mean, I built some rapport. I think you'd do a good job. Guess what? No, I can't. I'm not a hand specialist. I'm an emergency room doctor. You have to know what you're good at and do it. But you have to know when to bring in other people. And it takes a whole myriad of people in our lives to kind of bring healing. And sometimes we'll go to the pastor and we'll share about our marriage. And then he says, well, I want you to see these counselors. And you're like, oh, he's just palming me off. He doesn't know. He's actually smart enough to say, I'm not the expert here. But here's someone that you do need to go to. What are you good at? Maybe it's hospital visitation. Maybe it's hospitality. Maybe it's leading worship. Maybe it's preaching. Maybe it's prayer, encouragement, exhortation, evangelism. Figure out how God has gifted you and then be available to help people around you. Eleventh thing I've learned, and these go quick. Listen to the experts. <laughs> so often we get great advice and then we say, I'm going to go do what I want anyway. We do that all the time with the word of God, don't we? God says, here's the way to a blessed life. Um, yeah, but I don't like this and this. I'll, I'll, I'll change the recipe a little bit. I'll add some things and take some things away. You know what the hand specialist told me? Uh, after she unwrapped it all and looked at it and she went, that, that's bad. That's never good when they, she goes, that's, that's really ugly. And she says, but we got to take the splint off. And she says, what I want to, you to work on until I see you next week is you have to learn to bend that finger. Well, it's not hard to bend your finger unless it's busted. Guess what, though? I have full range of motion. Do you know how painful that was? First time I went, it really went, uh, uh, you know. 
but to go sit in a different room and moan. You know, your spouse can only listen to that so long. Be gracious with them. Um, the goal wasn't just saving the finger, it was getting the function in the finger back, right? Because what good would it be if I was like, well, I didn't lose my finger, but I can't, can't bend it, can't do anything with it. It's useless. And I think sometimes that's what happens to us in our life, the Christian life. We heal in the sense of, well, I saved it, but it's not healing in the sense that we're functioning Christians. We're stuck. And so I had to learn to bend it. Twelfth thing, it takes many people in your life to bring healing, and one of them needs to be you. Sometimes we want everybody else to do the work, right? Um, and when she told me, hey, you've, you've got to flex this, um, some of us, we're, we're not flexing our faith. We, we want to stay where it's safe. And flexing your faith is painful. It's hard. It's like flexing this finger. It doesn't hurt now to do that. Um, just like if you look back in your life, there was a time, that first time that you shared the gospel with someone. I mean, that was like freak out, scary. I, I, I'm going to throw up. I don't know if I can do this. The more you flex that faith, the easier that becomes. And instead of it being something, it is a fearful thing. It is a fun thing. I think the same is true with the spiritual disciplines. Um, I want to be careful with this, but how many of us flex when it comes to fasting and prayer? Um, silence and solitude. You don't want to be alone with God. Afraid of what we might find out. The Word of God. Uh, being in the Word of God. Another thing that I found really fascinating is, 13, you need to learn to feel again. And this is what's fascinating, because it, it wasn't just about regaining function, but it was also about regaining feeling. And I said, well, what do you mean I have to learn to feel again? And she said, your finger, if you don't teach it and help it to communicate with the brain, it, it won't have any feeling. Why, like, that doesn't just naturally happen? No. And she said, you know, when little babies suck their fingers and they're always sticking them in their mouths and touching everything, and that's what's going on. And she said, um, the way you do that is you're going to have to take that finger and you're going to have to touch hot things and cold things, like the window that's cold. You're going to have to touch different fabrics from smooth surfaces like this to, you know, you just, you're going to have to teach it how to feel again. Because what is one of the benefits of our finger? It's not just the function of being able to move but it's the ability to feel. Again, in the Christian life, some of us, we don't have any function and we don't have any feeling as we go about serving because we haven't taken time for that. The goal, when we're hurt, we often make the goal healing and forget feeling. Number 14, focus on the healing, not the hurt. Okay? Now, having said that, it's going to hurt to heal. But don't make the goal the pain. Allow it to be about the process and the purpose. And you are going to be overly sensitive for a while. Every morning I get up and I walk 10 miles. Um, typically I get up about 3.30 in the morning. It's my prayer time. Uh, 10 miles is because it was five miles to Jerusalem from Bethlehem. Uh, when the wise men came um, and said, hey, we want to go see Jesus. And it was five miles back. So I want to go see Jesus. I'm going to walk there and I'm going to walk back every morning. Now, I wear gloves. It's pretty cold. The other morning it was minus 10. This finger is like a barometer. It, it can tell you when the cold is coming. It hurts, right? It's overly sensitive. And it may always be slightly overly sensitive, but here's the reality. Don't get hung up on the hurt. Focus on the healing. Number 15, this is key. Use your healing to help others instead of your trauma to hurt them. Because if you don't heal, you will hurt other people. Hurt people hurt people. 
I had a great opportunity about a week ago to sit down with a couple. Uh, there were missionaries. They'd gone through some tr- tr- horrible trauma. And they were hurting. And I started sharing, here's what I've been learning about this finger, and here's what God's been teaching me about healing. And it was tremendously helpful to them. And, and when we got done, I had two thoughts. I, one was, if I'd never gone through that hurt, I wouldn't have anything to say. God uses all things for good, right? Second is, if I wasn't in the process of healing, I wouldn't be able to help. There are some things that you have gone through in life that you're going to be able to use to help other people, but you have to heal first. Um, Number 16, healing takes time. Duh. But we're a fast food society that just want it fixed immediately, right? And so here's the thing. Um, give yourself grace and give other people grace in the process. I had a, a really good friend, um, so I cut this finger off. <laughs> Man, my left hand doesn't like me. We have a bad relationship. It's abusive. Anyway, um, I did this before I was one. So in my defense, uh, it took me 50 years to get to the next one. So, you know, at this rate, I should have some fingers left when I get to heaven, right? <laughs> but... He, he said this to me, and, and it, it was kind of humorous. He said, um, when are you going to stop being so hard on your fingers? And it got me to thinking, it's all been on my left hand. But how many of us are hard on ourselves? How many of us are beating ourselves up? And, and maybe like me in one area of your life. And maybe it's the things that you say to yourself. Man, why am I so stupid? That's abusing yourself. So give yourself grace and give other people grace. Number 17, we're all connected. Um, do this for me for a moment. Flex your pinky. And, and what do you notice happening? Yeah, there's another finger, the weakest finger, your ring finger. And the reason it's the weakest, they share a tendon. You know what's really fascinating on connection? There were days or nights where this completely undamaged ring finger would start to ache. And I would start rubbing that finger, massaging it, and it would make my pinky feel good. And I was like, what's going on here? They're connected. And guess what my ring finger was doing? It was feeling the pinky's pain. We're told to mourn with those that mourn. But we don't want to do that. Why? Why? And that's why we somewhat stay disconnected in relationships, not really fully heart connected, because we don't want to be sad. We're to rejoice with those that rejoice, but sometimes we don't do that because we're jealous. But here's the truth. We are connected, and, and as a body of believers, whether that is in a home, as a family, whether that is here at church, we're connected, and we need to be sensitive to others. And it's okay to feel their hurt and to empathize with them. Almost done. Number 18, no matter how broken something is or shattered, you can pick up the pieces. And God will supply what's missing. So I asked the hand surgeon, I said, so what do we got to do if all the bones smash in the end of my finger? Which, by the way, it's kind of gross, but I can wiggle it. (laughs) There's nothing there but flesh at this point. And I said, you know, we got to put a rod in there. Do we? And I'm kind of like, what do we got to do? And she says, nothing. We just got to let it heal. She said, all those broken pieces will find each other again. What? She says, yeah, they'll come back together. And what's missing, they'll invite other cells to turn into bone and grow with them. But what an incredible picture of the church. When persecution came into the church under Saul, who later became Paul, absolutely shattered the bone of the church, the strength, right? But what happened? They came back together. What was missing? They invited other people to join them. Number 19, healing isn't always getting back to where you were. I don't know what this is going to look like when it's all said and done. It may never be quite the same. And I think sometimes that's what we do. We, we make the goal getting back to where we were. Can I say this? Joseph was not the same man in the palace that he was in the pit. Or even at home prior to going into the pit. 
How many of us, especially across America, church-wise, have made the goal with COVID, was trying to get back to the way it was before? I've got news for you. Those days are gone. Um, as long as you are taking the time to be in the process of healing, that's the key. And talking about those days are gone, there are some things that we have to let go of, and this is the last one, let go of what's dead. There's some skin on the end of this that's dead. Uh, the nail is dead. At some point, all that is going to come off, and I have to let it, okay? And it's a process, but you would think I was absolutely crazy if all the dead stuff that came off my finger I put in a little box and carried around. That's gross. And so is living in the past. And some of us are so stuck in the past, we're not living in the present. We're not being effective. There are some relationships that whether we like it or not, they're dead. And you have to let them go. There are some things in our lives that are dead or will lead to death. One of those is sin. You got to let it go. And here's what we do sometimes. We're living for Jesus, but we got this secret sin that we want to hold on to at the same time. Oil and water. The sin and the Savior do not mix. You have to be willing to let go of what's dead. So let me ask you those two questions again that we started with, and then I'll pray. What lessons are God teaching you? What lessons? And are you learning the lessons? Are you open to what he has for you? So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the things that we go through in this life that we don't rejoice in the trauma and the pain and the hurts, but we rejoice in the fact that you can do all things with those to make them not only a benefit for us, but for other people. So we just pray for whatever the hurts are in this room, people listening online, the communities around us, Lord, would you um, bring healing, but help us to do the things that you've called us to do. We pray all these things in Christ's name.